taking the relevant questions. We now come to the statement on building safety. Minister Lee Rowe. Mr Speaker, with permission, I would like to make a statement on the continuing work to fix buildings with unsafe cladding across England and the Government's increasing responsibility, increasing determination to enforce against those who fail to take responsibility. Since the beginning of 2023, there has been a step change in all aspects of remediation in England, from a limited programme to full coverage of all residential buildings over 11 metres. From developers not taking responsibility to now, them being responsible for £3 billion of remediation across over 1,500 buildings. From just over 1,600 buildings in remediation programmes last year to now over 4,000. From 783 having started or completed work in February 2023 to now over 1,800. And from only 461 having completed last February to now 863. Every month, more and more buildings identified, more and more beginning, and more and more completing works. And that now means, for some, albeit not all, that the end is in sight. From the start, we have prioritised the remediation of the highest risk buildings. 98% of high rise buildings with the most dangerous Grenfell style ACM cladding have either started or completed work. Of the 10 occupied buildings remaining, two will start work this month and enforcement is being taken against a further six. Substantial progress can also be seen for buildings over 18 metres, with over half of known buildings either having started or completed work. And the much more extensive work required for buildings between 11 and 18 metres is now well underway. Since the full launch of the cladding safety scheme last July, over 400 buildings in the scheme now have live applications, Grant funding agreements have been completed or are being signed for 152 buildings and works have started on site for the first building. A further 4,000 buildings are being investigated and, where necessary, will be invited to apply to the scheme in the months ahead. Further transparency is also being brought to the social housing sector. Registered providers report that work has started on 525 buildings as at the end of November 2023, up from 394 at the end of August 2023. A further 200 have now completed. And for the first time last Thursday, we published detailed information on a provider by provider basis. This will be updated quarterly to ensure residents can track what their individual provider is doing on remediation. Of course, whilst many buildings are getting fixed, or better still, have completed remediation, there remains a reducing core of building owners who continue to hold up remediation. This is unacceptable. The Government continues to do whatever is necessary to change that. All building owners must step up, do the right thing, and fix their buildings without delay, or face the consequences for their inaction. The Government is leading the way on enforcement with strategic interventions by our Recovery Strategy Unit, targeting the most egregious actors unwilling to make their buildings safe. The RSU were key to forcing Wallace Estates to agree to four remediation orders, ensuring 400 leaseholders will be safe in their homes. Our legal action forced Grey GR, a subsidiary of Railpen, to fix building safety defects at Galbraith House within three weeks. The first trial against Grey GR for Vista Tower in Stevenage is imminent. Nine remediation contribution orders were taken out against three further organisations last week, including developers, to recover funds paid out by both taxpayers and leaseholders to fix these buildings. And we will continue to take action against those who do not step up to their responsibilities. Colleagues in the fire and rescue services and local councils are critical to the fight to ensure residents are safe and we are working with them also to increase action. Many councils and fire and rescue services are doing a good job. Some need to do more. And over the last year, the additional funding we have provided councils with has meant that the pace of enforcement has stepped up markedly. Councils are informing us of enforcement action at a rate of four per week compared to one per month in 2022, 
and we expect this to accelerate further. And to support this, today we are publishing our first league table outlining where enforcement is being taken so that residents can see exactly what is happening and where. We will regularly update the league table to ensure the public remains sighted on their authorities' enforcement activity. Our focus now is on more and more consistent enforcement. Last week, I met with the building safety regulator and sector leaders to discuss how we can build a shared plan to increase the pace of remediation further. Today, I am announcing a number of initiatives to come to boost enforcement, a further £6 million to council enforcement teams, the development of a new regulatory protocol for greater consistency, and a new fund that partners can access for legal support in complex cases. For a task as big as this, Mr Deputy Speaker, remediation of buildings with issues was always going to take time. And there is no doubt that in some parts of the sector it is still taking far too long. Yet already, almost 60,000 homeowners have peace of mind that remediation is now complete. A further 300,000 dwellings are well on their way to doing the same. And every week that goes by, more is done. More starts, more completions. And vitally, more of those who are unwilling to do the right thing being exposed. Mr Deputy Speaker, we will not stop until we have fixed cladding issues. And today, I hope the House can see the real and accelerating progress that is being made. Opposition front bench, Mike Ames. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Deputy Speaker, can I start by thanking the Minister for the advanced sight of the statement? But I have to be clear, I don't quite share his enthusiasm that the end of the building safety crisis is somehow near, and neither do campaigners up and down the country, including Endar Cladding Scandal. Just last week, new government figures, which the Minister referred to, showed that only 21% of high-rise blocks have been fully remediated, I stress fully remediated. We're now nearly seven years on from the Grenfell fire, the tragedy where 72 people lost their lives, and yet hundreds of thousands of families and individuals are stuck in households with flats with dangerous flammable defects. Whether that's cladding, whether that's missing fire breaks, whether it's wooden balconies, the, the toxicity of this crisis goes on and on and on. Everybody deserves to feel safe in their own home, but despite years of reactive promises from the government, and now billions of pounds committed through a plethora of funds to fix unsafe homes, progress remains for far too many painfully slow. All this, of course, means that far too many people are living in fear of their lives every day. And what those families need is action. They need action now, action to speed up remediation and hold all those accountable for the building safety crisis. Action for all those trapped in unsafe buildings facing eye-watering bills, whether that's the black hole of service charges, insurance premiums. They simply have no control over their future. An action to let residents of these buildings finally turn a page. So I have to say I'm, I'm disappointed that today's statement is not much more than rehashing of statistics and data points w which were put in the public domain last Thursday. And I'm disappointed in particular, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this statement does not include the second staircase guidance which is so desperately needed. The Minister will know that the absence of this guidance has held up the construction of thousands of safe homes across the country. And in London alone, the Mayor has said that this has botched the implementation and stopped at least 38,000 homes from being built. In the time um, since the delay, key design details have been missing and both house builders and local authorities have been left in limbo. But what's more, some sites have completely ground to a halt. So what exactly is taking so long, Minister? And how many buildings nationwide does the Minister estimate have been held up? 
It would also be useful if the Minister could provide an update as in regards to the position on PEEPs, which many campaigners continue to push. Moving on to the specifics of today's announcement, I welcome the new initiatives to boost enforcement, but this would be more effective if it was part of a broader strategy instead of reactive piecemeal announcements. These initiatives, of course, are just a drop in the ocean of what is needed. And let me say, whilst I welcome the support for council enforcement teams, the Minister and the Government simply can't pass the buck. The Department needs to play a more active and robust role. On the new regulatory pro protocol for greater consistency, I certainly welcome that, but would like to see the details and a time frame. And the Minister rightfully calls out some owners and developers, but will he call out the manufacturers too? Make all those responsible for the building's uh, safety crisis pay. Finally, I want to mention quickly the scale of the problem with insurance premiums, which he would have seen reported uh, in The Independent earlier this week, and is constantly raised with me, and I know he's raised with the Minister as well. He'll be aware of allegations of profiteering and the many thousands of pounds being paid in premiums, even when buildings have been remediated, made safe, in some cases going up by a thousand percent. Since the Minister's previously mentioned pooling schemes, I know the industry has put forward their schemes which will come live on April the 1st. Certainly residents and campaigners are not convinced that will bring premiums down. So I'd like a, an update from the Minister for the House today. Um, because, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Minister won't need a reminder that today's announcement is just one cog in what needs to be turned to solve the building safety crisis. I look forward at times to be constructively working with the Minister to do the right thing for the hundreds of thousands of people still trapped in the building safety crisis. I look forward to the Minister's responses. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman from Weaver Vale for his comments. And um, I welcome the elements of his remarks which confirm that we are making progress and, and um, uh, will comment on some of the others uh, in a moment. Um, I take it that the Honourable Gentleman's reference to the fact that it's just quote-unquote rehashing of stats means that he's pretty content that the stats are actually moving in the right direction, which is indeed part of the point today. It is to highlight that we have made significant progress over recent months, significant progress over last year, while still recognising and having accepted in my opening remarks that there is much more to do that there are clearly actors who are not doing the right thing and that we are trying to take systematic consistent and coherent action against them turning some of the points which the honourable gentleman we've availed highlighted um, i would just caution him i did not indicate that the end of building safety issues is near despite both of us sharing that desire for it to happen as soon as possible but i did say that progress was being made and to get to the end point you make progress and i think that what this statement is demonstrating today just like the written ministerial statement did in october is that we continue as a government and as a country to make progress he highlights quite rightly the point about how this has taken time it has taken time but if you look at the individual uh, the, at the individual funds you can see that those that were open the earliest are now coming to a conclusion so the acm style fund 98 percent of known buildings are now uh, remediated or on the way to being remediated, which was opened in 2018 and 2019. For the Building Safety Fund, over 18 metres, the over half now are either completed or on the way to be completed, and that was opened in 2020. So again, it is progress. These things take time. They are often very complicated. We often have to unfortunately drag freeholders to do the right thing. We're having, uh, for example, to encourage buildings between 11 metres and 18 metres to uh, get involved in the, in, the, uh, in the fund, and we're trying to do that as actively as we possibly can. So there is work to do, but again, further, uh, so, uh, further progress is being made. The Honourable Gentleman raises uh, the specific question of second staircases. This is a, uh, an update with regards to building safety, but I, I will extend the scope slightly. We have committed to coming out having already provided some information about second staircases over the course of recent months. We were committed to saying by the end of this month 
uh, uh, providing further information on second staircases. I can confirm that that will occur this week. Uh, and uh, in terms of the point about enforcement, I would just gently say it is absolutely incorrect to talk about uh, reactive piecemeal announcements. If you go down the list of what is being uh, announced in the league table today, you can see clear evidence of progress that is being made all across the country. London Fire Brigade, 94 statutory enforcement notices. Greater Manchester, 32. East Sussex, 26. West Yorkshire, 14. Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, 11. I could go on and on and on. There are multiple pages here of where not only you can see progress, but the government is making this information as transparent as it possibly can in order so that residents who are impacted have the ability to understand where their individual bodies locally are and to hold them to account where necessary is. And then finally, just to uh, answer the question with regards to insurance, pre insurance premiums, this is something I know that the Honourable Gentleman and I share a great deal of focus on in terms of trying to make things move as quickly as possible on this. I completely agree with him that progress needs to be made. I am pleased that the industry announced the launch of, the, of their industry-led insurance premium uh, 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 scheme from the 1st of April, from next week. It has, it has bluntly taken too long. I spent an awful lot of time over the last few months uh, with the sector encouraging them to do that. We are monitoring extremely carefully from the moment it opens what the impact is on those buildings which are most affected and I hope we will be able to say some more about that in the coming months ahead and I would encourage colleagues who have insurance concerns and I know many have already raised them with me over in that who are sat in, who are in this house today to continue to do that where remediation is underway or where remediation is concluded we would expect to see some form of accommodation to be made against the premiums in those buildings unless there is a good reason not to do so and if if honourable members or right on others have individual examples of where that has not occurred, I would be very grateful to receive them. Father of the House, Sir Peter Bottomley. It's some years since our late colleague David Amos led a few of us in an interest in fire safety even before Grenfell. We have to remember that in the months after Grenfell, everyone backed away, thinking that residential leaseholders would be the only people who have to bear the ten to fifteen billion pounds of cost for remediation. And that was before we knew all about the other fire defects which our building control standards and inspection had allowed to accumulate over the decades. If you all hang our heads. The Minister has rightly talked about more transparency. And can I say in passing, but it's a very serious point, that anyone who looks at page three of the Financial Times today about the possible future policy on ground rents will see an indication that the people who own these buildings, the pension funds, the long harbours of this world, the Chengiz interests and others ought to be looking at their own social and environmental responsibility and say get rid of ground rents and spend their money when they can on making these buildings safe for everyone to live in. The cladding groups and the leaseholders groups deserve praise and so does Leasehold Knowledge Partnership and the present chair of Lease, the Government Advisory Service, who can point out some of the things which have not yet been done. This is an interim statement today. We look forward to hearing more, whether by written statement or oral ones. But can I say to the Minister, the one group who seems to be let off are the insurance companies yes. who backed the developers, the architects, the surveyors, the builders, the component suppliers. I think government should find a way of taking together potential claims of all the residents, tenants, leaseholders and owners of these properties and have a round table with insurance companies and get the billions of pounds out of them that they'd have to pay if it went to court without paying the lawyers half the money. I'm grateful to my honourable friend from Worthing West for his comments. He has been a long-term and long has a long-standing interest in this and leasehold on a more broader basis. He is absolutely right, my honourable friend is absolutely right to highlight the tireless work of so many people across the country from the groups and the organisations that came together, both that have come together both on the leasehold side, in which I know my honourable friend is, is involved in, and also on the cladding side, who did not want to come together, who did not have to want to spend the time 
uh, to, uh, to, to expend in order to make progress here, but end our cladding scandal and many of the other groups who work incredibly hard to ensure that we make progress. And I'm grateful for all of the constructive work that they do with us. It is absolutely the case that there is more that is needed to be done, but I think week by week, month by month, as the statement outlines, that we are making progress, and I hope that we can do more of that in the coming months ahead. And just finally, on the point about leasehold, my honourable friend, who is a long-standing campaigner on this, has highlighted his thoughts very clearly that no decisions have been taken. My, honourable friend, my right honourable friend, the uh, Secretary of State member for Surrey Heath, has been clear about his own personal views, and I know his views will have been heard as part of that discussion. Marshall Gordon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. One of my priorities in Battersea is to ensure that everyone has a safe, decent and affordable home. However, seven years on from the devastation and the Grenfell fire, many constituents are still living in unsafe buildings. The government support currently has so far been available to those buildings that are 11 metres or over. Now, it kind of beggars belief that this is the case. So, what is the government, and can the Minister be clear on this, doing to ensure prioritisation for funding is allocated according to risk so that all households are protected? So those households, many in my constituency, that are below 11 metres. Minister. Uh, with the, I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady from Battersea for her comments, but uh, with the greatest of respect, I don't think it does beg a belief that uh, there is a line at 11 metres. The Honourable Lady is chuntering from a sedentary position. I hope that she will listen to the answer before making comments on it in the first instance. Um, that is, t that is a, a, a relatively recognised position that, has been, that is relatively long-standing. And the reality is, as my predecessors from this dispatch box committed to back in 2022, where we have received concerns about buildings under 11 metres, we have taken action to look at those buildings, we have gone through them, we have commissioned reports where is necessary, and the overwhelming majority of those buildings, it has been subsequently confirmed, do not require remediation. So if any honourable or right honourable member has concern, uh, has standing concerns about under 11 metre buildings, I would encourage them to get in touch. We will happily look at them in more detail because if they follow the, pro the trajectory and the programme which we have seen in the ones which have been raised to us already, it is highly likely that life critical building safety concerns will not be visible once we have looked into them in further detail. Rachel McLean. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Now, there is a, a complex interplay between what the Minister set out today on building safety and cladding and remediation and also the leasehold and freehold reform bill and that whole agenda. Uh, which, of course, many of us in this chamber are still right behind. So will the Minister please reassure us that the Government as a whole remains committed to this vital, transformative and conservative agenda? As he himself has said from that dispatch box, there is no prouder word in the English language than freeholder. We want to see more freeholders liberated from the tyranny of the ground rent grazers and some of the deep pocketed people in the so called sector who are now trying to make out, if the reporting is accurate, that somehow if we uh, press ahead with our reforms to reduce ground rent to a peppercorn, then the whole sector will be destabilised and somehow his vital work of remediation will be affected. I and many others do not accept that asser assertion in any shape or form. It is, of course, complete nonsense. Will he please reassure me and many others that we are going to continue, we're going to reform this sector, we're going to liberate the leaseholders so that they can own their properties and also continue with making them safe? Minister. Uh, my honourable friend from Reddit, she's absolutely right that the work that has been put into the leasehold bill and what we've brought forward on the leasehold bill will be transformative for leaseholders. And I know that, and I know my honourable friend knows that, because my honourable friend was the person who put the work in in the first place, and I pay tribute to her uh, in, in this role previously. She is absolutely right to articulate the link here between those that are impacted by cladding and leaseholders in general. It is through reforms like the Leaseholder Bill that some of the questions quite rightly are, are highlighted by the Honourable Gentleman we've availed about insurance. We will be able to bring even more transparency to that area, not just for, uh, re, uh, for uh, leaseholders who are impacted by cladding remediation, but leaseholders in general, so that leaseholders know what they're paying for and they can absolutely recognise whether it's fair or not as a result. 
Sir Stephen Timms. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for meeting with leaseholders from Barrier Point in my constituency last week? On a Zoom call with leaseholders from Waterside Park last night, it was clear that the original builder and the current freeholder have agreed about the specification of the work to be carried out, but the work is being held up by quibbling between their respective lawyers over details. Is there anything the Minister can do or his department can do to knock heads together and get this long-awaited work underway? Yeah, yeah. I'm grateful to uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman from, from East Ham for uh, highlighting the uh, the, the inherent challenges sometimes within these processes. There are a lot of actors, it's often a lot of money, there are a lot of challenges and a lot of complexity within it. It is absolutely the government's view that those processes need to go forward as expeditiously as possible, that, that organisations and actors within them should not hold them up unnecessarily. There has to be a reasonable accommodation for reasonable discussions, but equally the overarching objective, which is to get those buildings remediated and to allow leaseholders to get on with their lives even more than they are able to do so at the moment is absolutely paramount and if there are particular concerns or particular issues which the honourable gentleman or any right honourable uh, member thinks we can learn in order to improve the policy i'll be very keen to hear them dr matthew often the cladding safety scheme is meeting the cost of addressing fire safety risks associated with cladding on residential buildings over 11 meters in height but that does not include low rise the Minister has been contacted by Barnet Council following an investigation into a fire at a low-rise residential property last year. Their investigation has concluded there are 459 properties in my constituency that constitute a Category 1 hazard as defined by the Housing Act 2004. The Council says the remedial works will cost each homeowner £23,000, and for many of my constituents that is simply an unaffordable amount. While low-rise buildings pose less of an escape hazard in the event of a fire when compared to high-rise buildings, the widespread existence of cladden defects is a result of regulatory and industry failure and was not caused by actions taken by my constituents. Does the Minister agree that is simply not fair and will he bring forward urgent proposals to assist my constituents in this endeavour? I'm grateful to my friend Hendon for raising uh, the matter of low-rise blocks. It, it does remain uh, the, uh, the evidence that the, the department has seen when it has looked at properties which are low-rise, which are under 11, that the overwhelming majority do not require uh, fire safety remediation. But I would be happy to meet with my honourable friend from Hendon to talk about that in more detail. It is important that uh, both the, uh, the, like, the low likelihood of a problem being present in terms of this definition which we're talking about today continues to be highlighted and secondly that there are routes to redress I think the extension of the defective premises act of 1972 uh, uh, I think it was uh, gives an opportunity to do that uh, and it's important that residents and uh, leaseholders and others know that those avenues to redress and I'd happily meet him to talk about them further. Jeremy Corbyn. Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for the statement he's made today and for the recent meeting I had with him and his staff about an issue facing my constituency. That is about Galliard Homes and residents of Drayton Park in my constituency. They have uh, been denied access to the necessary information. Galliard Homes claims the uh, fire safety regulations have been carried out. That is hotly disputed by just about everybody else. And as a result, the residents of uh, Drayton Park are paying vastly enhanced insurance rates, unable to move, unable to sell their homes, unable to move on with their lives in any way, causing unbelievable levels of stress, as many other colleagues are very well aware of in their own constituencies. The Minister is engaged with this and fully understands it. Can I ask him if he can do two things? One is release all the information about the fire safety assessment, so there's an air of transparency around all this. And secondly, ensure that the developers, Galliard Homes, step up to the plate, do the remedial work that's necessary to bring the insurance costs down and enable the, enable the residents to move on and get on with their lives. Um, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman from Islington North for highlighting this, and I'm again grateful for the meeting that he arranged with the leaseholder representative and for the time he gave to go through it. It's very useful to get individual cases and to work through them, even though often those cases are the most tricky and most challenging and most knotty, but it's important that we understand the implications of policy on them. Without going into detail about the individual property, which I'm happy to speak with the, uh, with the Honourable Right Honourable in more detail separately with, and we will continue the discussions on that, we will absolutely seek to be as transparent 
as we possibly can be in general, hence the publication of some of the additional data today. And we remain committed to making progress on both individual buildings and properties as a whole. And I hope uh, that the property which uh, the right honourable gentleman highlighted and the developer which the right honourable gentleman highlighted uh, will both make progress in due course as soon as possible. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank my honourable friend for the update that he's given. However, it does appear from the statement that he's made that there are two uh, tall buildings still with ACM cladding on which there's no work going on at the moment and no action by the government. I'd be grateful if you could clarify that. The other issue, which I think comes out of his statement directly, is there are now 4,000 homes between 11 and 18 metres where residents in those homes will probably be not able to get a mortgage, won't be able to insure their property, won't be able to sell their property. So will he speed up the process of assessing these blocks so that residents can feel safe and if work is required on them, that work is carried out speedily uh, and so the homes are made safe for either the residents or who they sell them to? I'm grateful for the question. Um, my honourable friend from Harrow East, uh, to his first point, uh, on ACM remediation, there are 11 buildings at the moment which haven't been, uh, which haven't started or uh, finished. One is not occupied of the remaining 10. Two will uh, commence in the next uh, few weeks. Eight have a further date against it, and the remaining two have enforcement action being taken by the relevant authorities. So whilst I would like that number down to zero at the earliest possible opportunity, it is better than it was when we provided the update in October, and I expect those numbers to continue to move in a positive trajectory in the coming uh, 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 months and weeks uh, ahead. In terms of my friend's point about the 4,000 which are being reviewed, um, we also provided a further 1,000 uh, uh, potential leads to Homes England, who were leading on the cladding safety scheme a number of months ago, um, a, a significant number of those were found to not require any remediation. So, whilst I cannot comment absolutely on where the 4,000 will land, it is probably likely that uh, a large number of those will not require remediation in the end as well. So, I would encourage residents not to worry necessarily about the number, but to see what comes out of it. And we have also taken action since December 2022 to try to make sure that we are starting to separate the need for remediation on properties with the ability for people to get on with their lives and so the mortgage industry and the mortgage sector has been freed up to allow or it's been freed up to allow people to take mortgages to remortgage to move properties when big life events happen and we hope that, that will continue i am monitoring on a month by month basis the large banks and building societies who are providing mortgages and i can see progress is being made in that regard finally Clive. thank you mr deputy speaker Last I've got a place in my constituency is in need of remedial work and the residents have been supplied with a letter of comfort from the developer saying that it will uh, cover the costs. But my constituent has written to me that in the last eight years his uh, service charges have gone up 360% and in the last year alone it went up by 107%. So he's now paying £6,000 a year service charge where Hamptons say the average for London for a similar size property should be £1,700. Now, my constituent says that these additional costs are, are, are building safety related. Now, what, what, what does the Minister have to say about that? And is there anything that can be done to stop these, these uh, developers from recouping their costs in this sort of way? Well, the first thing we need to do is bring greater transparency to service charges, which is what we're trying to do through the leasehold reform bill. So assuming that the, uh, the progress is made in the other place, uh, I hope that will be on the statute book as quickly as possible, and then it will be clear exactly where these uh, costs come from. The second thing uh, that can be done is through our colleagues in the Financial Conduct Authority who are bringing in the fair charging regime to make sure that there are inappropriate commissions or work that is on, or, or active interactions which are underway, exchanges are underway from an insurance perspective with brokers, which hopefully will reduce uh, the, uh, the cost there. The third thing is the industry-led insurance scheme, which hopefully should bring down insurance costs for the mo uh, the, those that are the most exposed. But no, the Honourable Gentleman from Eltham is absolutely right. We need greater transparency. We need a greater understanding of where these costs are going. We need to make sure that freeholders and managing agents are actually following the law, which is very clear about the kind of crime of costs which can be allocated and which can't be allocated. If there is something that the government uh, can look at specifically on this building, I'd happily talk to him separately. Order. 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 Can I thank the opposition from the bench and the minister for their participation in the statement? Point of order.
Next, Smith. Michael, 